How long did I figure? He says, well, whenever you get done talking, just sit down. <laughs> and so I went, and it was an experience. You have to experience the worship. You have to experience the prayer with them. And when they do the offering, they don't pass a plate. They have two sharply dressed young men up front, and they have a couple of other sharply dressed young ladies waving flags, and they are singing the giving song as they march forward and drop their money in the offering plate. And it is complete engagement. And when you're speaking, they talk to you. <laughs> and they went, I like this place. And one of the things that you would hear a lot is, Amen. That's right. That's right. So if you haven't gone, you need to go and see your brothers and sisters in a different worship element. It is encouraging, engaging, and you hear them talking a lot to the preacher. Now, having said that, uh, I have uh, the opportunity to introduce uh, Marsha Montenegro, uh, who also is not uh, shy about making her feelings known. Uh, and I have grown to appreciate her for that uh, because I need to know what it is that people's needs are in order to attempt to fulfill them to the best of my ability. Marsha is delightful. She knows what she's talking about. She was a former professional astrologer. She wrote the, they actually had an astrology test to be licensed in Atlanta. I said the Board of Astrology In what? The Board of Astrology Examiners at Plenty Lake. Okay, well she's going to tell you what it was. Because I'm not doing, but she wrote the licensing test for something important. Uh, <laughs> and, and she's kind of our go-to person for most New Age stuff. She's written a lot of articles for our journal, MCOI Journal. By the way, if you are interested in getting that in the mail, sign up downstairs at our sign-up sheet. Uh, sign up uh, on our website for our email that goes out every week because we keep you posted on whatever it is that we're doing. But Marsha is knowledgeable, passionate about the Lord, She's um, apologetically trained at Southern Evangelical Seminary, Dr. Geisler Seminary. And so for Dr. Geisler, in many ways, this is kind of old home week uh, because many he knows and who care deeply about him were here. Marsha, would you come and speak this morning, this afternoon? Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm delighted to be able to share this information with you today. And I did have outlines on the little table there in the foyer. And if you didn't get one, I don't know if they're all gone. If they're all gone, if you could share with, if you want to, share with a neighbor <laughs> that has one. Um, you have, okay, there's some more there. Okay, great, thank you. I, uh, I have uh, my notes for this talk are much longer. What you have is a shortened version. So you will hear me read things or say things that are not on your outline. So it's not because you're missing a page. My mic, I turned it on. It says on. I turned it from you. It is on? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so, hopefully it's working. So, you, I just want to let you know that, so don't like be looking and, oh no, where is that? So that's, that's, the, that's the thing here. If you want the full outline, you can email me and I will be happy to send it to you, send, me, send you my Word doc. So, the topic is, is there a mind in mindfulness? And I'm going to, you know, explain all of this. <laughs> First, I want to say it's everywhere. I don't know if all of you have noticed this word. Have you noticed this term, mindfulness? Have you seen being mindful? Mm -hmm. Have you kind of heard that? Okay, it's really, really big. Some of you, it may not have quite hit your areas yet or where you live or what you deal with, but it is everywhere. It's in the business corporate world. It's being put into a lot of elementary and secondary schools, universities. It's in healthcare, it's big in psychology, and it's in the military. 
And this is a growing thing. I have been tracking it for the past several years, and it has just multiplied by leaps and bounds. I, it's just kind of overwhelming to try to keep up with it. And there's so many articles on mindfulness. If you just want to get an idea of it, just go to Google and put in mindfulness and see what comes up. Or put in mindfulness in schools and see what comes up. And I'm going to talk about that too. Now I am going to mention psychology here and I'm going to be talking about some Buddhism. And I just want to say up front, I am not a psychologist, <laughs> nor do I have any training in it. And I'm not an expert on Buddhism. However, I did study and follow Buddhist teachings for about 14 years. Uh, when I was in the New Age, I was very drawn to Eastern religions, first to Hinduism. Then I got with a Tibetan Buddhist group in Atlanta, Georgia. I learned the Tibetan Buddhist meditation. I went to their weekly meditation sessions and teachings. They would do, you would meditate for an hour, and then somebody would give like a little lecture. And I read the books. So I was really kind of getting into that. And then for different reasons I won't go into, I left that group and went into Zen Buddhism. So Zen Buddhism is something I was into for a good 12 years, and I practiced mindfulness meditation for 12 years. So I speak as somebody who did it. Uh, so what I'm talking about here is not just from my knowledge of it and research, but from actually practicing it. And I'm going to talk about the real world effects on somebody who does this. Okay. First of all, what is it? Um, <laughs> because you hear the word mindful and people use it you know, be mindful about how you, you know, write that paper or something. It's not the normal meaning. It's not what you may be used to hearing. That is not what this mindfulness is. According to John Kabat-Zinn, which, and I'll talk about him more in a minute, he started kind of a wave of mindfulness in this country. But it started first for patients at the Massachusetts Medical Center in 1979. Now, he's not a doctor. I think, if I remember correctly, he has a degree in microbiology. But he started um, mindfulness meditation for patients with chronic illnesses. And he says, mindfulness is the awareness that arises by paying attention on purpose in the present moment non-judgmentally. And people who promote mindfulness will quote him. This is what they'll say, and they'll say, Oh, as John Kabat-Zinn says, and then they'll quote this. And that's another way to find out how popular he is, is to put his name in Google. <laughs> okay, he's, his name is everywhere. Um, or maybe you could call it, mindfulness is being present with a whiff of cardamom. And cardamom is a Hindu, or an Indian spice. Um, and I think this was said sort of, I don't know, facetiously by this man, Jeffrey Nunberg, who's a linguist at the University of California. That's the humor for my talk right there. <laughs> so enjoy it while you can, because <laughs> I don't think there's any other funny lines. <laughs> That's all I could come up with with mindfulness. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Um, all right. And so here's more or less how I define it, although this isn't exact. There's a lot more to it. It's a form of Buddhist meditation involving sitting still, although there is walking mindfulness, breathing slowly, and often counting your breath is the real way to do it. Allowing thoughts to enter your mind, noticing their effects on you, if any, in, non, in a non-judgmental manner, and then letting them go. So you're supposed to see your thoughts coming into your mind like, this is how I was taught, like clouds. So they pass by. You see, oh, there's a thought. You know, I mean, what you do is you're thinking. So a thought comes to you like, oh, I forgot the grocery list at home. And I've got to go to the grocery store, and I don't have the grocery list. OK, you're supposed to immediately think, that's a thought. You're not supposed to get engaged in that worry about the grocery list. That's a thought. Let it go by. And you do this, and eventually you get to a space where your thoughts are so distant from you and the way they're passing by in your mind, that you're really in a state of non-thinking or a state where you have gone beyond thinking. 
beyond thought, which is the point of it. Okay, so that's a very vague definition, I think, but um, kind of captures the essence. Mindfulness is actually the seventh step of the Buddhist Noble Eightfold Path. So they call it right mindfulness, developing awareness, if you hold yourself dear, watch yourself well, levels of awareness and mindfulness of things, oneself, feelings, thoughts, people, reality. Okay, that's from a website, BuddhaNet, about Buddhism. And you'll see it, you know, expressed different ways. But it is part of the uh, Noble Eightfold Path in Buddhism. You have, um, you have the four Buddhist basic truths, and then you have the, the Eightfold Path that you're supposed to follow. And this is all to achieve enlightenment. And I'm, I'm going to talk more about Buddhism, so this is just kind of little introductory things here. However, in our culture, it's not marketed as part of the Noble Eightfold Path. It's not marketed usually as Buddhism, unless you're with a Buddhist group. It's marketed as stress reduction, a way to focus, a way to heal from trauma. That's how it's being used primarily in the military. Um, especially with wounded veterans programs, a way to be kinder, more compassionate, to cultivate what they call openness, and that has a meaning in the Buddhist sense of the word, and for depression. Openness is, kind, is an idea from the Buddhist point of view as far as the way it's practiced here. Now keep in mind, when I talk about Buddhism here, some of the things I'm saying are actually part of Buddhist doctrine, but my main lens for Buddhism is as a New Ager, or as I was a New Ager, and how the Buddhism is imported into the West. I actually sometimes call it Western Buddhism, <laughs> okay, because this is how the New Age operates. It takes these concepts from other religions or other cultures, and then it kind of reformulates them, and the essence of them is still there, but it may not be exactly the same. So I just want you to be aware of that and don't think that everything I say is a strictly orthodox Buddhist <coughs> doctrine, although some of it will be. Okay, so there you go. That's the new age for you. you can't. It's very hard to draw lines. <laughs> um, so openness is like where you aren't prejudging anything. You are open. You're, it's supposed to be spiritually open to whatever, you know, whatever truth you may grasp. You have to be open because if you're not open, you're going to close off those doors and you won't get to enlightenment. So you have to have this spirit of openness and, and yielding to whatever may come. That's more or less what is meant by that word. All right, now we get more into the, the uh, origin and purpose of Buddhist mindfulness. It's to get the meditator to see his or her thoughts and eventually the self as independent of who they really are. In other words, to divorce you from your mind. It's really a divorce. Thoughts are downgraded as chatter or monkey chatter in Western teachings of mindfulness. I actually read some articles, and I don't know how true this is, that said Buddha never used those terms. He never used chatter, monkey chatter. But that's the way it's, it's formulated in the, expressed in the West. I don't really know for sure. And keep in mind that the teachings of Buddha were not written down till at least 500 years after his death. So now think about the Bible, how close the Bible was written, or the, let's talk, the New Testament, how close the New Testament was written to the resurrection of Jesus and then 500 years for Buddha. So there's some disputes, like you don't really know, is this really historically correct? Did Buddha really say this? There's no way to really know for sure. Um, <clears throat> the Buddhist view is that the individual self has no permanent reality. And this is called anatta or uh, anatman or no self. Or I've also seen it as non-self, non -self, N-O-N S-E-L-F. Atman, A-T-M-A-N, is the term in Hindu beliefs for the permanent, unchanging self or soul. So in Hinduism, everybody has an Atman, 
this unchanging soul which is really divine. And in Hinduism and the Hindu meditation, you're supposed to realize the existence of the Atman and that that's your true self. Buddha, who was from India and was raised in Hinduism, broke with Hinduism. Well, what he wanted to do was reform it, kind of like Martin Luther wanted to reform the Catholic Church. <laughs> and then you had the Reformation. Buddha was trying to reform Hinduism. He didn't like the caste system. He didn't like all the, the elaborate rituals and all these complicated things you had to do to get enlightenment. So he was reforming it. So actually what he taught is that there is an Atman, which means no Atman. There's not this divine self. There's not a self at all. So there's no self. That's usually the way it's termed. However, there are some branches of Buddhism or people who teach Buddhism who will say the question should not be answered. So <laughs> if you say to somebody, well, I really like to know, does Buddhism teach that there is a self? Or does Buddhism teach there is no self? Their, their doctrine is, you sh we, can't, we're not, we shouldn't answer you. <laughs> so, um, okay, I haven't come across that too much, but I did, I have come across it a little bit, but usually it's that there is no self. Because supposedly Buddha said that that question should not be answered. Mahayana Buddhism. All right, now there, let me just quickly say there's two major branches of Buddhism. There's Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. And Theravada Buddhism is more in Southeast Asia like Thailand. And Mahayana Buddhism is in Tibet, China, Japan, Vietnam, Korea. And they are two different branches. And the main difference is that Theravada Buddhism sticks to the Pali, the Pali books, the Pali teachings, which are the earlier teachings of Buddhism. And it doesn't go beyond that. Mahayana Buddhism accepts later teachings of Buddhism, like the, all the sutras, like Diamond Sutra. I think sutra just means teaching. So there are all these later teachings that came along, and Mahayana Buddhism teaches that. Also in Theravada Buddhism, which I'm not as familiar with, but I know about these differences, um, they focus more on uh, monkhood, becoming a monk, only monks can become enlightened, and you can't become like a Buddha yourself. But in Mahayana Buddhism, uh, if the focus is not so much on being a monk, it's more that everybody can become enlightened, and through that they're becoming sort of a Buddha. People can become Buddhas. The Dalai Lama is considered, um, there's more than one Buddha too. So the Dalai Lama is considered one of the Buddhas. He's considered an awakened one, an enlightened one. And he's also the 14th incarnation. A Dalai Lama is a title, it's not a name, it's a title. Loosely meaning ocean of wisdom. And, he, and there's been 13 other Dalai Lamas before the one alive now. And the one alive now is actually the same one as all the others. So he's been Dalai Lama for 14 times, basically. Um, <laughs> I, could, oh, I better not get off on the Dalai Lama. I could talk 20 minutes about that. All right, because there's a lot to say about that, too. All right, but that's not the topic. <laughs> Back to this topic, Marcia. <laughs> all right, so I wanted you to know a little bit about that difference. And Mahayana Buddhism is the type of Buddhism that's in the New Age. And that's... What, what you're going to be hearing today is more related to Mahayana Buddhism. So you have what they call sunyata, which is often translated as emptiness. I don't think that's really a good translation because when we say emptiness in English, we think nothing. You know, like, well, that's nothing. But that is not really what it means. It um, really means formlessness, I think is a better word. But here is a brief definition. All beings and phenomena are empty of self-essence. They don't really have an essence. That's sunyata. Okay, so the Buddha nature in Mahayana Buddhism. This is what Zen master Dojin said, and he's very famous. When I was into Zen Buddhism, I read a lot of quotes from this guy. To study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. 
To forget the self is to be enlightened by the 10,000 things. So right there you've got, you know, forget the self. Now we're back to John Cabot Zen. I'm sorry, we kind of have to jump around because it's kind of a complicated <laughs> big ball of yarn here. <laughs> uh, John Cabot Zen, who's regarded as one of the main people to introduce mindfulness in the United States and who is revered, and I mean revered, by the teachers and promoters of mindfulness, makes it clear in this video, I have a link here, if you put it in a URL it should come up, that your thoughts are not you and are mere, he calls them, soap bubbles. This is based on the belief there is no permanent individual self. At about 2 minutes 20 seconds, Cabot Zinn states, when you see that you are not your thoughts. He wants you to watch your thoughts in an impersonal way because there is nothing, no, nothing, uh, no such thing as personal in Buddhism. All right, so I'm, what I have that there for is to kind of confirm what I'm saying here. Now, okay, here's some more Buddhism for you. <laughs> and this is, this is very doctrinal Buddhism. So you may be sitting there thinking, well, you're telling me there's, well, Buddhism is telling me there's no self, but I know I have a self. I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm listening to you, you know, I'm, I'm maybe hungry or I'm not hungry. Um, I have these feelings, you know, I love my children, et cetera, et cetera. And you're like, and you're telling me this is not real, and I, yet and here I am experiencing all these things. Well, the answer from Buddhism is that you, your sense of having an individual self is because of the five aggregates or the five skandhas. They're also called the five heaps. And this is them. It's form, sensation, perception, mental formation, and consciousness. So form is just the form, the physical form. Sensation is experienced through the six faculties. Now this includes your mind. It includes your mind. So that, you know, the eye and the ear, hearing things, smelling things with the nose, tasting things with the tongue, and the mind is connected to ideas and thoughts. The mind is a sense organ. So it's called manas, and it's important to understand the mind or intellect is a sense organ or faculty, just like an eye or ear. It's not like a spirit or soul. That is not the way Buddhism sees it. So the mind is kind of classified along with the nose and the ears and the tongue. It's very important. By the way, this whole section here about the five aggregates is all a quote from uh, BuddhismAbout.com. I don't think I have the exact link there, but I could probably find it if you wanted to email me. So I did not write this. Um, this is straight from this website, but it's the stuff I've, I've heard and I've read about. Then there's perception. I won't read all of these. Mental formation and consciousness, which is awareness but not recognition. It's very complicated. You see how complicated how they're dividing up? the mind and perception and thinking and sensing. You see how, how, how complicated it is? They have all of these different categories. This is totally alien to um, really a, even a Western view of the mind and body and very alien to the biblical view of who we are. Um, but this is why most, I don't think most people in the United States have any idea what Buddhism teaches. I think they think it's about meditating and being peaceful. And I think that's what people think Buddhism is about. It's very esoteric. It's extremely esoteric. All right. Now, the Buddha wove his explanation of the skandhas into many of his teachings. The skandhas are not you. They are temporary conditioned phenomena. They are empty of a soul or permanent essence of self. And when we realize these aggregates are just temporary, and not who you are, not me, we are on the path to enlightenment. In fact, there's a book about Buddhism and mindfulness, and it's called Thoughts Without a Thinker. Now, that kind of says it all. <laughs> if I had to give a one-minute lecture on this, I would just say that. I would just say that. That's, the, that's the book, Thoughts Without a Thinker. Now, think about that. <laughs> um, of course, that's a thought, right? <laughs> it's very self-refuting. 
All right, here, I've got to go to one of my little notes here on this topic about um, egolessness. And so you may think, okay, this is how they say we got in, this is how ego came to be. In the beginning, things were going along quite well. Now, what things were going along, I'm not sure. At some point, there was a loss of confidence in the way things were going, and there was a primordial panic, which produced confusion about what was happening. Rather than acknowledging this loss of confidence, there was an identification with the panic and confusion, and thus ego began to form. This is known as the first skanda, the skanda of form, called rupa. After the identification with confusion, ego begins to explore how it feels about the formation of this experience. If we like the experience, we draw it in. If we dislike it, we try to push it away. If we're neutral, we ignore it. But the way we feel about it is another skanda, impulse perception. Then you try to identify or label the experience. You try to categorize it. That's a skanda of concept. And then the final step is the birth of ego, the skanda of consciousness. Ego begins to churn thoughts and emotions around and around. This makes the ego feel solid and real. The churning around is called samsara, which is often called the wheel of rebirth as well. It means literally to whirl about. The way the ego feels about its situation determines which of the six realms of existence it creates for itself, because there's six realms that you go to after death, which I won't go into, um, but they're, they sound very strange, like there's kind of there's the ghost realm, which is not a ghost like we think of it. There's the uh, semi-divine being realm, there's the animal realm, so anyway, so this is samsara, which has to do with the wheel of rebirth. But this is their explanation for how the ego came to be. And I remember um, hearing this, not exactly like this, but in one of the Tibetan Buddhist lectures, they said that they used a, the, um, I think the god, the monkey god, Hanuman. And they talked about how there was this kind of formlessness, and then there, there was a dissatisfaction or a, curio a curiosity, I think. and that kind of began this movement, and the movement, this curious movement, then began to take form. And somehow Hahnemann had something to do with it, I can't remember what. <laughs> and so Hahnemann, the monkey god, uh, you know, got curious and got attracted to the form, and that created more form. And then soon there was, you know, actual form solid things in the world like planets and stars and then there were people and animals, etc. So it all started from this kind of formlessness, which is not nothing, and then it became form through this curiosity or, or an attraction. It's very Gnostic actually because the, some of the Gnostic teachings were that, you know, we were all spirits and the spirits got drawn to matter because the evil God, the demiurge, created, you know, matter, and the spirits had bodies, and they got attracted to the bodies, and then they were trapped in them. And so the goal was to realize you were really a spirit trapped in a body. And Jesus supposedly was teaching how you get freedom from this form, this body that you're in, and earth, which is also, you know, solid form, and you have to get free of it. So it's very similar. I, and I know that um, there's one person I know who's an expert on Gnosticism who thinks that Gnosticism came from the Eastern religions and that that's where it comes from. Okay, so that's the ego. All right, now the ultimate goal is to dissociate from your thoughts and mind and self in order to detach from desires which cause <coughs> suffering. Because one of the Buddha's truths is that, okay, there's suffering, everything is suffering, but there is a way out of suffering, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. So the goal is to end suffering. Well, how do you end suffering? Well, suffering exists because you have desires, but, but here desire means a little something different. It doesn't mean like, oh, I want a Coca-Cola or <laughs> I want a good job. <laughs> It's more a grasping at the world of form. 
it's your attachment. So you're attached to being a person, you're attached to life, you know, as it is, you're attached to this world, your, your whole life becomes an attachment to a false reality. And so you think it's real. And in order to break that cycle, you have to cultivate detachment. And detachment means that you are unattaching yourself, you're disengaging yourself from the identification with this false reality and with the false self, which is your individual self. They also call it the conventional self because they'll admit that there is a self in a sense. You know, they'll say, well, yeah, there is kind of a self because you think you have a self and you operate as a self, as an individual, and that's called the conventional self. But ultimately, it is not real. It's just false. And once you cultivate detachment, mainly through meditation, you'll see, you'll grasp that truth, and then you're on the road to enlightenment. Is this making sense to you? I hope this isn't too strange. Is it too bizarre? <laughs> Are you all understanding me? No? Yes? Some of you? Sort of? <laughs> I think I have yes, no, and sort of. <laughs> okay. It's, it's, is it strange? All right. Yeah, it's supposed to be strange. <laughs> I'm trying to explain it the best way I can. Um, and the best way for me to understand it and explain it is formlessness. Formlessness is the ultimate reality, and form is the false reality. And form includes everything in the material world and your individual self and your thoughts. And that's all false. And you're trying to get from form to formlessness or to the awareness that formlessness is the ultimate reality. And basically, formlessness is sometimes called the Buddha nature or the Buddha mind or the big mind. So you'll hear different. You'll hear different. There's a book called, um, I think it's called Big Sky Mind. And it's about the beat poets because Zen Buddhism really first got in this country through the beat poets. Do you all know who the beat poets are? Okay, a lot of you don't know. They were, and I don't, you know, I don't remember them, but they were real big in the 50s and into the, some parts of the early 60s. How many have heard of them? I'm just curious. Eric knows. Okay, several of you know the beat poets. And the beat, not just the beat poets, but the beat writers. You know, Kerouac on the road. Okay, they're very, they're very famous. Pearl and Getty. Pearl and Getty, yeah. Pearl and Getty. Who's a couple of other names? Yeah, Kerouac. Ginsburg. Ginsburg. Alan Ginsburg. Alan Ginsburg is a poet. Powell. Powell. These were the beat, beat, beat people, the beat poet, beat writers, and they got into Zen Buddhism. And Big Sky Mind is a book all about that. And they wrote, some of their poetry was inspired by Buddhism way back in the 50s and early 60s. Okay. So, now we're back to John Cabot Zen again. <laughs> Can't get rid of him. <laughs> He started, he called his system mindfulness-based stress reduction, and even now you can see it, it's usually uh, abbreviated MBSR, and I think it may even have another name now, in 1979. Now, he was a student of a Zen master, and he's a founding member of the Cambridge Zen Center. Now, I went to a mindfulness it was a meeting for the parents of children in the schools in Arlington County, Virginia. And it happened about a year ago or so. And they, I found out about it from some of my prayer partners who got emails about it who live in Arlington County and have children in the schools there. And I found that's how I found out about it, because my son is too old for that. <laughs> He's not in school anymore. So um, I went to this meeting with a friend. And what it was, it was, we're going to tell parents about mindfulness and how it can help your family. And I was very interested. I went. They had a psychologist. She's a psychologist at one of the high schools in Arlington County who knows about, who studied mindfulness and uses it in her counseling. And she was a speaker. And what was interesting about it is that they gave us a sheet of exercises and that, that they said, we're going to try to do these exercises in the group, you know, in the meeting. 
And the first exercise, I, can't, I don't have time to tell this, but the night before, I had this incredibly one of the most evil dreams I ever had in my life. And it had to do with Lucifer, it was the whole theme of the dream was Lucifer rising, and the light of Lucifer was coming in, and I saw all these young people going to this big building where they were going to be indoctrinated. And it, I really, it was really evil, it, was, it really chilled me. And when we went into this room and I looked at the exercise sheet, the first sheet was about letting the light, a meditation to let the light come in through the top of your head and go into your body. And I saw that and I was like, that's what that dream was exactly like this. I mean, I, per I personally think God uh, gave me that dream to, or allowed me to have it or whatever. I don't believe that much. In, I don't do dream interpretation. I just want to make that clear. But I think that dream was to remind me of how evil this was. Because when I went in there, that was like foremost in my mind. It was like God was saying, don't water this down, Marcia. Don't water it down. You, you can see it's evil. Don't step away from that. And that meditation is a New Age meditation. I had done it many times as a New Ager. And she led the group. Of course, my friend and I did not do it. And I told her, I said, we're not doing these. <laughs> she says, oh, no, I know. I don't want to do them. <laughs> and I said, we'll just sit here quietly and pray. And she led them in this meditation where you imagine, first you slow your breathing down, you get calm. Then you imagine a light coming in the top of your head. This is a very evil meditation. This is opening yourself up possibly to demonic influence. And you let the light, you see the light go through you. Well, of course, you're thinking, right? You're thinking angel of light, right? Because that's what this is, angel of light. Light, New Age, the New Age loves the word light. There are so many New Age books and teachings using the word light. They love using that word. Okay, so that was a little side bar there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so... Uh, uh, anyway, oh, I know why I was telling this story. Um, <laughs> so at this meeting, I eventually raised my hand and said something. I said, there have been no long-term studies of the effect of mindfulness on children, which is true. And I said, there have been studies showing there are negative effects of mindfulness, which is true. And everyone kind of looked at me, and, and I asked the teacher, I said, are you aware of this? And she said, no. I said, well, I have links that I can send you. And she, she was very nice. She said, I would like to see them. And I did eventually send them to her. But when I was talking, there was a woman sitting at the table next to me who kind of turned around and just gave me this very long gaze, like, kind of like, who are you? And it wasn't really hostile, but it was, it was very wary. And I just got this feeling about her. And I thought, There's, she's into this. Well, sure enough, after the session was over, this woman came up to me and told me she teaches mindfulness at some military, secret military institute. There's so many secret institutes in Washington, D.C. <laughs> in the area. There's like tons of secret. I have friends who can't tell me what they do. I, you know, I don't know what their job is. And she, um, <laughs> she teaches at one of these kind of secret military things. And um, she says, I teach mindfulness there. And I could tell from talking to her, because I was in the New Age so long, she, I could tell she was New Age. I just knew she was a New Ager. And she said, what's your, what's your problem with this? And I said, you know, I did mindfulness for a long time. I said, I know it has an effect on people. I said, one of my problems is, is that they are not telling people this is Buddhist meditation. And she said, oh, I don't teach it as Buddhism. I'm teaching it as, you know, this relaxation. I'm teaching it as a stre you know, being stress-free and calming. I said, I know, and that's the problem, is that people, people should be informed before they're taught something. They should be informed that there's a spiritual element. And so we went back and forth a little, and then she said, are you Buddhist? And I said, no. <laughs> I think she thought maybe, maybe I was upset because they were leaving Buddhism out. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> I said, no, but I did used to follow it. And I didn't even say I was a Christian. I didn't even say that. I wanted her to see there were objections, secular objections to this. So anyway, we talked a little bit, and we kind of, you know, it was a very pleasant exchange. There was nothing hostile about it. 
But she was kind of like, she said, oh, she said, interesting, interesting. And that was, you know, kind of the end of it. I have another story, too, I'll tell, I hope. <laughs> All right. Who else popularizes mindfulness? Fish, I'm not sure how to say this. Fish not Han is a Zen Buddhist monk. How many of you have heard of him? Oh, Paul Cardin knows him. <laughs> um, okay, this is one of my issues, is that Christians don't know these people, and you really should know them. He has written, every book he's written has been a bestseller. He's, he writes, he tours the United States and talks to people in the United States. He's not like over there in Vietnam. He's here in the U.S. And he has influenced people. He has a book on mindfulness. Goldie Hawn, now I'm sure most of you know who she is. <laughs> Goldie Hawn is a Zen Buddhist. She um, started something called the Mind Up Program in schools. And the reason I have, I don't know if on your sheet I have Loudoun County, Virginia in parentheses, do I? I do? Okay, Loudoun County is a big county outside of Washington, D.C. It's next to Fairfax County where I live. It's a huge county where a lot of people go live. They have huge, big houses there. Um, I found out only recently, like a month ago, from a friend of mine who lives there, that they have the mind-up programs in the Loudoun County Public Schools. And I did not know this until my friend told me. And the way she found out is that she knows about mindfulness from me. And she told her son, who's in the fourth grade, if anybody ever tells you to sit and close your eyes and to breathe slowly and, uh, you know, to either not think or to imagine certain things in your mind, she said, don't do it. So she t and she said, tell me if that happens. And she told me that she said this to her son. And the very next day, she... She sent me a message on Facebook and said, Marsha, guess what? My son came home from school yesterday and told me that the guidance counselor came in his classroom and led them in a meditation. And my son said he would not do it. I said, well, good for your son. I commend him. Fourth grade, you know. Um, and she sent emails to the principal, the teacher, I don't know who else, somebody on the county board. <laughs> and she said, I'm opting my son out of this. And they did let her opt him out. But see, it's all, how many parents were aware that that... The only way she knew it is that she had told her son to let her know. He may not have even told her about it if she hadn't said anything to him because he wouldn't maybe think anything of it. So this is why I tell parents, if, even if you're in a Christian school, because I'm afraid this is going to come into the church, and it already has in a certain way, not as far as I know Christian schools, but nothing surprises me anymore. So you need to let your children know about this and tell them if this happens, you come tell me. All right, you need to do that. Um, so Goldie Hawn has this Mind Up program that uses mindfulness. Dan Siegel is a psychologist who's really promoted it big time. And Representative Tim Ryan from Ohio became a devotee. And he's trying to get mindfulness in the schools everywhere. They're already all over in Ohio. He wrote a book called A Mindful Nation. He's been on all the big programs on TV like Good Morning America and all that stuff. He is a big, big pusher of mindfulness. Now here's what happens. I watched an interview with him about how he started doing it. And I don't remember the details, but it had something to do with, uh, I don't know, he was going through some kind of stress. This is always what happens. And then I guess someone suggested it or he decided to do it and he did some mindfulness and he felt better. And this is my opinion, okay? I think there are certain things that people do. It's like an occult initiation, and it initiates you into it. Because I've seen people do things like what he did, and it's not just that he promotes it and he thinks it's good. He's a devotee. That's why I use that word on purpose. He's a devotee. He's devoted to it in a religious sense. And um, it's like mindfulness is his idol. And that's very dangerous. And I think that can happen with yoga. And it definitely happens with <coughs> Eastern meditation. And of course, it happens with occult practices. Um, now, Tara Brock is another very famous one. She's a psychotherapist. Um, she completed a five-year Buddhist teacher program um, at Spirit Rock Meditation Center, which I believe is in Massachusetts. I'm not real sure. Is anybody here from Massachusetts? I think it's in Massachusetts. 
under the guidance of uh, Buddhist Jack Cornfield, who has written several books on Buddhism. I read him when I was in the New Age. She trained psychotherapists to integrate mindfulness strategies into their clinical work. I'm getting emails and messages from people on, online who have emotional issues, who are having to go to counseling and therapy for their issues because it's serious enough that they need to go on a regular basis. And the, many of the things that they're told they have to do incorporate mindfulness. And I just got a message from a woman last week, and she says, I'm supposed to do this therapy, and they do mindfulness, and I don't want to do it. What do I do? I don't really know the answer to that, because she needs the therapy. I said, ask if there's any way you cannot do the mindfulness. I mean, I can't give her mental health advice. I'm not qualified. And I feel so bad for these people, because they're at the mercy of the mental health system. Um, Tara has a big insight meditation community. It's in, right there in Washington, D.C. It's one of the largest in the uh, United States. And they, uh, the Washington Post had a huge article on her with pictures and everything. It was almost like free advertisement. It wasn't, it, was, it wasn't a critical article, and it wasn't very neutral. It was like, this is great. Look at all these people who go here, and you know, they, get, um, you know, they get calmer, and they deal with their lives better. Um, okay, so here I have another little story. Um, when am I supposed to stop? <laughs> do I have an hour and 15 minutes? Do I stop when, do I, sit, do I just sit down when I'm done? <laughs> I, think that, I think that was the message that Don was giving me. <laughs> that was a hidden message. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Just preach on. I preach on, all right. I've got Paul's command. <laughs> um, uh, there's a high school very near me, a few miles away, Woodson High School. And Woodson High School has the largest auditorium of any high school in the county. Fairfax County is a very big county. It holds, the auditorium holds a thousand people. Okay, so I found out again from prayer partners who have children in the Fairfax County School. Actually, several people told me this, including a teacher because they sent emails to all of the, par the parents who have children from nursery to high school in Fairfax County. And they said, we're having a seminar on mindfulness, you know, June 4th, blah, 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 at the school. It was in the evening, not during school hours. And we invite you. We want you to come. I thought, uh-oh, this is not good. <laughs> and so another friend and I went, and um, in the lobby, they had all of this literature. They had a huge table covered with literature on mindfulness. And over here was another table with Tara Brock's materials, which are overtly Buddhist, overtly. And her CDs, her books, her literature promoting her meditation center over here. And I'm like, how does she merit all of this? You know, she, and she's getting money from this stuff. And it's in this public school. I'm like, my goodness. Okay, so we went in, and the two speakers were Tara Brock and Representative Tim Ryan. And Tara Brock was first. And, oh, I wanted to tell you, the auditorium holds 1,000 people. It was at least 95% full, at least. So that meant there was close to 1,000 people there. A lot of teachers were there, parents, and there were some, high, I think, high school students. So Tara Brock starts talking about mindfulness. She's a, she's a very engaging and charming speaker. And, you know, she's a psychotherapist. She knows how to manipulate people with her words. I'm not saying she was doing it on purpose. I'm just saying, you know, that's kind of her way of dealing with things, I guess. And. Everyone's sitting there riveted on this because of the way she talks and what she says. And then she says, we're going to do a couple of little mini mindfulness sessions here. And so it came time to do one. And they ring, sometimes they ring a little bell. You know, I don't have the little chime, you know. Ding! You know. <laughs> and so anyway, so she says, now just do what I say. And so everybody, you know, she's like, everybody just sit still, be relaxed, have both feet on the floor. Now just kind of breathe normally and just, you know, listen to your breath and 
Um, don't let, just let your thoughts go. She, she basically led everyone. My friend and I, of course, once again, did not do this. Um, I looked around to see if I could find anybody who wasn't doing it, and I couldn't. Now, I was in the back, so I couldn't see everybody, and there was almost a thousand people there. I didn't see anyone around me who wasn't doing it. Everyone had their eyes closed. She led them in that for five minutes. Now, here's the thing. Here's my theory. Um, and there, I think there are people who will back me up on this. After you do that with a group of people, you have and you lead them in that kind of meditation, you have made them open to what you're going to say. It's a form of hypnosis. And so you have gotten the person in this very calm, receptive mindset because Eastern meditation makes your mind suggestible. That's the main danger. It makes it suggestible to ideas you normally would not entertain. And so after this session, I turned to my friend and I said, now they're all going to be receptive to what she says. And my friend agreed with me. She was a, um, a clinical um, psychiatric, she was a psychiatric, she had been a psychiatric social worker. So she knew a little bit about, she knew about the psychology field. So um, that happened and then Tara Brock goes on and talks and I took notes. And she said a lot of very Buddhist type things, but it wasn't overt. You would have to know about Buddhism to recognize it. Then she led them in another meditation, kind of seals the deal. This is all very evil. This is not innocuous. It's not innocuous. It's the main point I want to get across. And then uh, they introduced Tim Ryan. And I had already heard him in interviews and read interviews, and the, it was very hot in there, and the seats were very <laughs> uncomfortable. So we only listened to him for five minutes and then we left and we just really couldn't sit anymore. That was like enough to take. And I went out into the lobby and of course no one was out there except one person at the table and I took as many brochures as I could <laughs> without being too obvious. You know, I was like picking them up and kind of, you know, picking them up and picking them up and like, okay, come and do it. <laughs> and, and you know, then finally the woman looked up at me and she goes, uh, and I said, oh, I said, sorry, we have to go early. Um, <laughs> I said, thank you very much. <laughs> so actually, I was speaking on, this, on, on Eastern meditation, or Eastern religions, Eastern spiritual influence to a Sunday school class at my church, either in that Sunday or the next Sunday, and I wanted to pass some of that out. But I might have done that anyway. So <laughs> anyway, OK. Um, so that's my story on that one. Now, there are people who are not necessarily advocates of mindfulness, but they're advocates of some form of Eastern meditation who have influence. In other words, when people are advocating Eastern meditation, even if it's not mindfulness, it, it helps push mindfulness. And these people are David Lynch, the filmmaker, who is a strong advocate of and devotee of TM, Transcendental Meditation. And Ken Wilber is one of the most influential New Age uh, perennialist philosophies. Uh, and the Dalai Lama, okay, I was going to read um, something here. John Kabat-Zinn says this, anything resembling religious vocabulary can be anathema to many people. He prefers to use a vocabulary that doesn't exclude anybody. And the reason I'm reading this quote is because um, this is what happens. And I'm, I'm calling this kind of new age, even though we're talking about mindfulness, is when anything like this is pushed in the culture, they hide the real meaning with familiar words. And it's covert. It's not obvious. So that's why it's like it's stress, it's, for, it's to make you feel peaceful, it's to calm you down. Um, we're not going to use the religious language because this will scare people. So they just leave the religious language out, but the concepts are still there. But they're using Western familiar terms, it's happened with yoga too. So that's how it gets in. It's very, very sneaky. Um, and Ken Wilber, I just want to read, this is what he said about meditation. It's on his Facebook page. All right, all spiritual practice is a rehearsal, an enactment of death. 
as the mystics put it, you die before you die. Then when you die, you won't die. In other words, <laughs> in other words, if right now you die to the separate self sense and discover instead your real self, which is the entire cosmos at large, then the death of this particular body mind is but a leaf falling from the eternal tree that you are. Keep in mind, Ken Wilbur is very, he's very Buddhist in his outlook. He doesn't call himself a Buddhist, but I can tell from reading um, his book that was recommended by Rob Bell, by the way. And, um, yeah, Rob Bell and Velvet Elvis, his first book, tells his readers in a footnote to take three months and read Ken Wilbur's book. I think it's a theory of everything. And, and I read that. It's extremely New Age and Buddhist in orientation. Uh, meditation is to practice that death right now by resting in the timeless witness and disidentifying with a finite objective mortal self that can be seen as an object. In the empty witness, and witness is capitalized, in the great unborn, unborn is capitalized. These are Buddhist concepts. There is no death, not because you live forever in time. You will not. But because you discover the timelessness of this eternal moment, which never enters the stream of time in the first place. This is the meaning of be here now. This is the real meaning of be in the present moment. I hate that phrase. And it's very popular. Oh, I just want to be in the present. Be in the present. I'm sure you've heard that, right? You heard that phrase? Um, this is the real meaning of it. It's because if you're in the present moment, and only the present, and you let go of the past and future, you come to realize th those aren't real anyway. So you have to disengage from it, and the present moment is not even time. It's an eternal now. And that's what you're supposed to realize. Eckhart Tolle wrote about that also in his first big bestseller, The Power of Now. So he's very Buddhist in his orientation too. Eckhart Tolle and Ken Wilber are both very Buddhist. Okay, now what are some of the dangers? The Dalai Lama I'd like to talk about, but I, I don't want to spend too much time. Let me just say he's influenced a lot of scientists and neuroscientists by having these seminars at his Mind and Life Institute every year. And they come and he has urged them to study the effects of meditation on the brain. All right, what are some of the dangers and criticism? All right, there are psycho documented psychological dangers. I can also, if you email me, I can give you a whole list of articles that, that are about these dangers. Um, using mindfulness to treat problems could short circuit other possible better treatment for the problem. Uh, there's a book called The Buddha Pill, P-I-L-L, -L, which I'm reading now, which is a study by two psychologists. They took a look at, at, at the first chapter is actually on TM. But they also took a look at most of its mindfulness and they're critiquing the methodology that was used. Because right now, if you look at most things promoting mindfulness, um, it's all going to be positive. They're not going to tell you there's anything negative. And that's not true. Um, it has really messed up some people. So um, they said, this is a, 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 well, this is a comment from a customer about the book who agrees with the book. He says, often taking this non-judgmental stance toward emotionally charged thoughts and memories by accepting them nominally as just mental events. He said, that's what you're supposed to do in mindfulness. The issue is that this approach seeks to decondition the emotional charge of the thought or memory and does not deal with the holistic reality of why the memory still maintains an emotional charge. You're not really dealing with a problem, in other words. You're just bypassing it. Uh, there's a lot of bad science because there's a lot of hypotheses and speculation, but not many large long-term studies. Um, poor methodology, for example, they don't use control groups. You should always use a control group in a, a scientific study. So there's a lot of criticisms. Um, and I'm not going to read this, I have another quote where uh, actually came from Tricycle Magazine is a Buddhist magazine for Western Buddhists. <laughs> and um, they had an article on this where they had somebody, and this is in a Buddhist magazine, 
critiquing the studies, especially a study that said mindfulness makes your brain grow. And this woman, who's a scientist, said that the, the study wasn't done right, it wasn't, it's not really correct, and she said it's a lot of speculation. There is a difference in brain thickness, but we don't know if the cause is practice or lifestyle, or if people with thicker brains are simply attracted to mindfulness. <laughs> That's what she said. Okay. Um, also, another critique comes from people, uh, kind of the social justice people, anti-capitalist people who are saying the big corporations are doing this to make their employees happy. And they say they want them to be happy so they won't be restless or dissatisfied, they won't ask for promotions or more money as much. <laughs> and they, there, is a, there is a segment, or there's a group of people, and I actually have a quote which I'm not going to read because that's not my main issue with it, but I did put a quote in here. Um, there are people who are saying this, and they're saying this is just the way the capitalists keep their workers happy. So there's that criticism. <laughs> All right, there's the use of a religious meditation for secular purposes coming from people who are Buddhist and see this as a misuse of Buddhism. And then, of course, there's spiritual dangers. Um, and now, once again, I have another uh, thing about the Buddha pill, which is a, uh, I don't know if I have this in your outline or not. It's a, I do? Okay, well, I won't, I won't read it then. And let me see, I have a note on it where I have, like, footnotes on my notes and notes on my footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> I almost had notes on the notes on the footnotes. <laughs> I kept that in the, I'm, I love notes. I'm a real note taker. Um, so I'm just not going to, I'm not going to read that. Because I want to get to the spiritual, the spiritual factors for non-Christians in doing mindfulness. It can lead someone to a false belief. Could make them interested in Buddhism, for example. It makes the mind suggestible. It becomes a convincing substitute for true spirituality with the true God. And that's, I think, the main danger, because it becomes a substitute. And I was in this for a long time, and I thought it was spiritual, and I was feeling peaceful from doing mindfulness. So now I did say there are some dangers, and there are some dangers, um, psychological dangers, which I mentioned I had some articles on that, and I can send you where some people who have done mindfulness and who did not have problems before, first they said, well, yeah, people who have problems and maybe shouldn't do it if they're real neurotic, if they're certainly if they're schizophrenic or something, they shouldn't do this, um, or real, real traumatized. But now people who are just like normal, everyday people who didn't have any real issues did went to mindfulness retreats and lost it. They lost, I mean, they really had a hard time. They... Uh, one woman said there's a BBC radio program I listened to where they talked to, to three or four of these people on the program and who the, where these people talked about how, it, how the negative effects on them. What is that? I can't see. One minute or five? Five. five? Thank you. Um, is that um, they either went into a depression or one said that, that she law herself became fragmented. She lost a sense of self, and that's exactly what Buddhism is supposed to do. It's supposed to fragment your sense of self. That's what it's supposed to do. Um, okay, so it creates a barrier to the gospel. That's another danger for non-Christians. The spiritual factors for Christians, it can take time away from prayer, the Bible, and reading uh, the Bible, studying the Bible. In fact, I think that it would undermine it. It creates an addiction for experience or false spirituality. So even if you think you're doing something that is innocuous or helpful or maybe even Christian, um, I think you can get addicted to it because it's an experience. You start needing it every day. You know how people who are runners say they, they have to run. If they don't run, they feel messed up. Well, that's okay because they're just running. But this, this, is, this is a dangerous thing because it affects the mind and I think the spirit. It can alter your worldview over time, making one more open to ideas that undermine the truth. Uh, I should say the truth, not two truths. And it can create more focus on yourself because you become very self-absorbed, uh, which is ironic, right? Because you're actually supposed to realize you don't have a self. <laughs> Although, the mindfulness programs aren't telling you that. So see, you've got 
this, pro, this whole thing of mindfulness all over the country, down to little elementary school kids. Do a search, uh, say video, elementary, elementary school children doing mindfulness. And just watch one of them. There's a lot of them. And you'll see these little kids sitting there or lying down like this. It's very, very creepy. Um, and they're being indoctrinated. Uh, and everyone thinks it's great. The school thinks it's great. The parents think it's great. And these are future generations. And they're growing up with this mindfulness thing. Uh, now, the Bible says, first of all, we are to seek and desire things. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Suffering is not due to false identification with a false world or false self, but it's due to sin. That's what suffering is due to. That's a big difference between the Buddhist concept of suffering and the Christian, the Christian truth. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Romans 8, 22. Suffering, at least for Christians, is not always bad. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. James 1, 2, and 3. There's another quote, 1 Peter 3, 14. I won't read. I'll read the one about Jesus. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Jesus willingly took on suffering and death for the sake of those who believe to give eternal life. And that is a good way to talk about this with someone who's into this Buddhist philosophy um, of suffering. And that Jesus, well look, Jesus actually took on suffering. It was something that he willingly entered into. He didn't try to avoid it. He entered into it in order that those who believe on him won't have eternal suffering. So, you know, you can kind of word it the way you want, but that, to me, is a point you could use with someone who's in this kind of New Age Buddhist thinking. Well, I think my five minutes are up. Um, this was a lot of material. I hope that it helps you understand. I want you to really be aware that mindfulness is growing and you are likely to encounter it at work. Your child's like, likely to encounter it in school. If you have family members in counseling, they're likely to encounter it with their psychologist. And um, it's really much, much more widespread, I think, than most people realize. Thank you very much.